This is Conversations on Discipleship with Father Adam Streitenberger from St. Gabriel Catholic Radio and Diocese of Columbus Media. Welcome to Conversations on Discipleship. I'm your host, Father Adam Streitenberger. With me today is Emily Bauer. Welcome, Emily. Hi, Father. Great to have you. Let's start Thanks. with a prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day and this time together. We ask that your blessing be upon us, um, upon our conversation, and upon all of our listeners. Um, we ask that um, you reveal to them in a special way your love and your mercy for them this day. We ask this through Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome, Emily. Um, this is the beginning of a series of com conversations with Emily. Um, you know, and Emily, you are a missionary with SPO mm -hmm. at OSU, mm -hmm. um, kind of one of the um, higher up missionaries. I don't know if yeah. we're allowed to say that or not. Is that? Yeah, I do a little bit more with the region. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's just recently you're kind of responsible for more like Arizona. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Texas. I started helping out with about three years ago now, and then Arizona's this year. So. But you're staying yeah. in Ohio. I'm staying in Ohio. That's good. Yeah. That's good. I'm an Ohio girl. Ah, good, yeah. good. Are you from Ohio originally? Yeah, I am. Oh, I didn't yeah. realize mm -hmm. that. Yeah. For some reason, I thought you were from Minnesota. No, everyone does, <laughs> which makes sense. A lot yeah, of people yeah. come from Minnesota, Where I guess. are you from in Ohio? <laughs> I'm from West Ohio, a really small town okay. called Fort Recovery. Okay. So I did most of my growing up there, but my mom's whole side of the family is from Putnam County, so... If Excellent. you know, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> God's country. Well, great. They say. <laughs> well, you know, as we start out the series of um, conversations, um, as always, we kind of like to hear your story of faith, how you came to know the Lord. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of helps us to see how the Lord works in unique ways in everyone's life. Um, so maybe you could start off with that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I grew up in a small town, um, very kind of culturally German Catholic, which you can probably tell. <laughs> um, but my family was really faithful. So growing up, we always went to Mass on Sundays. And I remember um, in high school, my so after my freshman year, my sister went to college. My older sister went to Bowling Green, and she got involved with their Newman Center there and I saw the difference in her, in her faith life. And when I went to visit, I remember being around the people and being like, wow, these people are really happy. And um, I was just really struck by that. I think I had experienced growing up a lot of faithfulness in faith and in belief in God through my parents and, you know, the community uh, most people were Catholic that I grew up with. I'd see my school teachers at Mass on Sundays and stuff. But So I think I'd experienced it as really faithful, but that kind of put this, like, idea in my mind that it should be, like, really joyful. And the word I think of looking back was it, was really, it felt really vibrant, and it mm. kind of made me feel like something was missing. Um, so in high school... I mean, we had CCD class. We were on Wednesday nights, Mary Help of Christians. Um, so I just remember at that point kind of like going to those and, and getting frustrated. I would get like frustrated because I would go and the class was fine and people were like goofing off and blah, blah, blah. And so I just remember thinking, man, this is supposed to be really important and people seem to not really care. And I think there's more than just like what we're doing here. And so that kind of started things stirring. Gina, my sister would come home and be like, do you want to go to daily mass? And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, so when I started Looking at colleges, I remember thinking, I want to look at colleges that I just think college is going to be my time to figure out what do I think about the faith and 
to really choose it. And so I remember thinking that. So I started looking at some colleges that were Catholic um, in Ohio, mostly Steubenville, Franciscan, and Xavier, University of Dayton. And then I, I looked at a public school as well because practicality and mm-hmm. finances and stuff. So I looked at Ball State and I remember like, okay, they have a Newman Center there. And um, I ended up going there. <laughs> And I'm really grateful I did. I got pretty um, involved right away. I remember, like, a real moment of choice at the beginning of college. I was in the marching band, so we were having band camp, you know, before classes all started. And it was Sunday, and they left no room in the schedule for mass or, you know, church services or anything. And that was really different to me because growing up it was just – Everyone went to church on Sunday, mm-hmm. you know, and like sports and things. They did not, you didn't have to really worry about that. And they didn't serve meat on Fridays <laughs> in the school. And um, so I remember like sitting there and being like, what am I going to do? Like, I think the church is in that direction. And I, I have enough time. I could go during lunch. And so I decided I would go and I picked up and I walked over and I went and I met this girl who um, happened to live in the same building and she's like, can I sit by you? I said, yes. And we kind of became buddies from there. So I got involved with a Bible study um, soon after within the first couple months. And um, I remember people telling me, you can pray. <laughs> we should pray. We, ha- we can pray. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. And they're like, you should be praying like an hour a day. (laughs) That's like a high expectation, so I don't know. But I kind of took that to heart. I was like, yeah, I think I want to do that. I want to try it. And I never had had any kind of real personal prayer life before. I had like prayed to God um, and had some good experiences of the Lord answering prayers. But so I would go chapel and I'd sit there for an hour and hour would be up and I'd leave like okay I think I prayed I don't know I was <laughs> I was there for an hour I <laughs> did my time um so yeah let me try to fast forward here a little bit I would say that was kind of the beginning of something really good and the opening of grace my freshman year of college I was I was starting to do that with prayer. I was starting to go to daily mass and in this Bible study, and I had a faith crisis. I was like, "Oh my gosh, I'm doing all these things. What if Jesus isn't real?" <laughs> and I remembered that someone had told me faith is a gift from God, and so I prayed and I was like, "God, okay, doing all these things. I think I need the gift of faith because." this could all be like really weird if it's not true. (laughs) And he poured out the gift of faith. And I'd say, so that was a big turning point. Toward the end of my freshman year, I went on a retreat and it was the first time I had had the chance to really be prayed over. And um, I think that was probably my first real experience of the Holy Spirit being what I would call a baptism in the Holy Spirit where it stirred up this reality that God is real and he is my father and he loves me and the experience of the community, this was at the college my sister went to. Mm. So the experience of the community was like a real vehicle, I think, to experience the love of God. And I remember being like, ah, people have to know. (laughs) And I went back to school and it was like the grass was greener. Like I looked at people differently and I remember my friend walking in um, my house and being like, I, like, how are you? Like I just saw her with such new eyes and really had the desire to know. So it really unlocked something in me and it unlocked prayer. That hour of prayer turned into I wanted to read the scriptures and read through the gospels. And um, so it was really a rich time. And my sophomore year was a good experience, I would say, of the Father's love. As I look back, I can kind of point to, you know, freshman year, it was like 
faith crisis, Jesus. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Sophomore year, the father, and he's real, and he loves me. He's proud of me. Junior year, the Holy Spirit. I was became more aware that the Holy Spirit is a person and that he wants to like live in me and operate in me and through me. Um, so that was really big. And that's when I started getting introduced to SPO. So my older sister started serving as a missionary with SPO. And at first I was pretty like, nope, nope, that's <laughs> your thing. And SPO is charismatic. So I was really like, nope, that's your thing. And sounds a little odd. And But as I became more familiar with the Holy Spirit and I would visit her and experience these times of she would have with her house and the people she lived with of prayer expressively. And um, it just kind of became really attractive to me. Like, wow, they're really free. And as I heard more about it and learned more about it, I started to desire that. And I think um, being around them afforded me the opportunity to proclaim Jesus as Lord of my life, which I had never done before. So this was in my junior year of college, and I had never spoken the words, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. And that was really a big turning point for me and um, experiencing the freedom of worship and prayer. Um, so after college, I decided to serve with SPO and came to Ohio State. So did three years on campus, three years as a chapter leader leading the team, and now I'm working with the region. Excellent. But, I think one of the, the key points um, from that is this idea of really understanding yourself as a daughter of the Father mm-hmm. and experiencing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of um, leads us into what we're going to talk about in really the, the next mm-hmm. couple segments, and that is feminine spirituality mm-hmm. um, and really owning and um, understanding um, kind of the unique um, identity which women have um, in the Lord. Mm-hmm. So um, maybe you could start off the conversation, some general general thoughts on feminine spirituality. Yeah, that's a big... <laughs> <laughs> you just lobbed me a big yeah, one there. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> general thoughts. I do, I will say, I think the piece of identity is really key. Um for anyone, I think, man or a woman, to dive into what does it mean to be a daughter? What does it mean to be son? To really sit with that. What does it mean to be child could be the question. But I think when you start asking, okay, child, yes, but daughter. Mm-hmm. What does it mean to be a daughter? And um, it's just so cool. I My... I have a couple of nieces and a nephew and a lot of friends with children. And I think that's such a, an easy place to look and kind of see, um, see it manifest a little bit more and get little, you know, glimpses of some truth of how the father sees us, um, his children and his daughters. I was this summer, I was visiting my sister in Kansas city and my goddaughter, Madeline, she comes in to the little like breakfast area and she's like messing with something. She goes, we're Gina and I were talking about her husband, John. And she goes, daddy, Madeline, daddy, he calls me daughter. Beautiful. (laughs) And I just thought that was so pure. And I was like, way to go, John, like way to tell your daughter who she is. She is daughter and she is beautiful. And, um, how important that is for her to hear that she's beautiful and for any woman to hear that she's beautiful or to hear her father in particular speak some real truths about who she is. I'm starting to ramble, but no, maybe no, you no, can no. direct think, me. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. I think... These um, are just the thoughts Well, that and, and I think before we kind of, as we analyze this sort of topic... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so first of all, let me, let me say you're the expert on this. You know, I don't know anything about feminine spirituality. So, um, but I think 
if, if in, in analyzing this sort of question of what is feminine spirituality, what, what you've started with has to be the foundation. You know, we first have to f- um, understand the identity. You know, like that's the foundation mm-hmm. of everything. Mm-hmm. I think um, so often in Christianity, we, we start off with what we should do or what we ought to do mm-hmm. um, and not with who we are mm-hmm. and kind of the source of that idea. So you always have to begin with mm-hmm. identity. I think um, the most fundamental idea you know, identity is a child of the Father, you know, Mm -hmm. and as the Lord says, um, unless you become like little children, you know, this is sort of the heart of Christian spirituality is living as a child Mm -hmm. of the Father. Um, And so, you know, like the first, you know, the first question I think of feminine spirituality is, what does it mean to be a child? Um, And we can talk a little bit about that, but I think as you rightly kind of point to is, you, if we're going to talk about feminine spirituality, we have to begin to frame that child like as mm-hmm. daughter. You yeah, know? well, it, it makes a difference that met, you're a man and I'm a woman, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and I think that's something that's it's really um, kind of it. It's something our culture is kind of against right now, and. I think for us, it, it's a really brave step to say, I'm going to, okay, you know, like I'm a child, but there's like a reason I'm a woman, you know, mm-hmm. and not a man. And there's something to that. And it, it means something. And um, so to dive into that, I think is is like pretty brave. And I think... To, I mean, for anyone, but I think for women especially, I was kind of sharing this with you earlier, but I think women, one thing I think about is we're such a mystery, and when you think about God, you know, I think that's a, a characteristic of God that we embody and exhibit mm-hmm. really well to the world, and uh, maybe it's just me, but I often find I'm a mystery to myself, and... um yeah, I just, I think that's a really helpful place to start too is as we talk about feminine spirituality and and all that to kind of understand. I mean, you're calling me the expert, but I'm like, oh gosh, Father, there is so much I don't, I don't even know about my own self and my ways and really like only the Lord knows I'll be plumbing the depths forever. And, well, and that's yeah. a crucial point. I, I would say, like, that's sort of my, um, one of my fundamental principles in life is the mystery of self and the mystery of others. You know, like, mm-hmm. the human mm-hmm. person is a mystery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I th- I think it's very easy for us to try to define ourselves um, and to th- define others and to kind of, you know, mm-hmm. project some sort of meeting. But I think it's all, it's foolhardy. You know, like I think it's foolishness. Mm-hmm. You know, St. Paul, um, I'm reminded, St. Paul says, you know, um, don't judge me. I don't even, I can't even really judge myself mm-hmm. in the sense that, um, at least I've always understood Paul in that sense is, you know, like even like looking at myself, I cannot fully explain mm-hmm. um, what the Lord has done in my life mm-hmm. and how he is at work in my life and mm-hmm. what he has made, mm-hmm. you know. From this, from this kind of mess. Yeah, you know? yeah. The mystery. I mean, the mystery part. It's true of anyone. I think the way I've experienced it as a woman sometimes is um, it can be a little. It was helpful for me, I think, to hear that and to kind of come to peace with that reality that I'm gonna like act in ways or um, even my prayer and my spiritual life. I'm not always going to understand it. And that was really hard for me. It was really a struggle because I want to understand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think probably generally as women, we want to understand and we want, like we really want things to be clear cut. We want to know that we're doing the right thing. You are talking, we want to do the right things mm-hmm. and be the right kind of way and check the boxes and, and, you know, that's Eve's sin was the control and the grasp, you know, like, 
control. And to not understand is really um, a challenge. And I think it's a big step to be able to say, okay, Lord, in this in my life, I'm not always going to understand. I should seek to understand, and I should take the time to recognize what's going on in me and what what's going on in my life and to seek to understand the Lord and who he is, but to be okay with that I'm not always going to know for sure if I'm doing the right thing or if I'm, you know, like being the right kind of woman or loving the Lord in the right kind of way. And I'm not going to know for sure if I'm like perfect, Mm -hmm. (laughs) basically, but to be okay with I'm trying and, um, and he sees me, you know, and I don't know if this is making sense. No, it does. And I think, um, first of all, I think it's, it's, at least in my mind, it's giving, um, a path that we can walk. Um, but it's what the point that you make is, I think very key is, um, you are, you know, you're a woman and uh, obviously you're a woman, but the, I think, what you, what you bring out is, um, do I, you know, how can I embody this perfectly, or how do you embody this perfectly? Well, in some ways you can't, mm-hmm. but at least your experience as a woman, you know, points to uh, you can begin to define your identity mm-hmm. um, as a woman mm-hmm. based on these experiences, as as mysterious as it is. So even though you are a mystery and being a woman is a great mystery, it is something which can be kind of defined and explained yep. based on your experience. And that, I think, is how we're going to proceed, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. is really looking at your identity as a woman in in sort of kind of like four classical, you know, as daughter, maybe as bride, as sister, and as mother. Mm-hmm. Um, not just in sort of the natural sense, but mm-hmm. as, I mean, all of those sense, they have a permanent value mm-hmm. in relation to God. You know, mm-hmm. like if, if you think... Um, as a daughter or as a bride or as a sister, as a mother, just in in your human relationships? Mm -hmm. Well, none of those last forever. Mm -hmm. You know, like your parents are not going to be around forever. Could we say it's an indelible mark? Is that, I don't know if... In your relationship, yeah, in your relationship. It's like on you, it's in you, you know, like those things are, it's not, it's like stamped. Yeah, exactly. In In relationship to God. Mm -hmm. Um. Because that's, uh, I think that's the point. Is so often we identify ourselves in ways that are transitory, mm-hmm. you know, like in human relationships mm-hmm. or in the relationship to our job, mm-hmm. or to the work that we're doing, or to the relationship that we're in, mm-hmm. um, which I think sets us up for problems. But so Emily, we've kind of set up, um, kind of looking at feminine spirituality from. The perspective of four relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, those relationships are lived with the Lord, mm-hmm. although they they do kind of point to um, natural relationships. Um, the first one being a daughter, mm-hmm. um, that every woman is um, by baptism a daughter of the Father. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I have absolutely no idea what it means to be a daughter. Um, you know, this is something that um, it's, I have never experienced nor ever will experience. Um, so what, and, and you know, like for me to describe what it is to be a son, um, I don't think that that's the way for us to understand what it means to be a daughter. You know, like, oh, let's translate. So how do you experience being a daughter of the father? Yeah, thanks for, I, you know, I, I am grateful that you just said that because I think sometimes when we talk about um, what it is to be a woman, we kind of measure up against and we look at what is like, what are the men? Mm-hmm. Who are they? Like, and what does that make us? And I think um, it's just good to recognize that 
it's not a measuring up thing. Mm-hmm. It's actually, it's like the equal dignity thing. And um, yeah, so thanks for saying that. And to your point of these identities of daughter and bride and sister and mother, manif- like thinking about them in our tangible earthly relationships, but also thinking about them in relation to God, it was making me think there's a, a line in the mass, usually sometimes I think, that you can tell me. Um, it says, like, help us to use the things of this world and temporal affairs in order it to eternity, mm-hmm. right? Like, and I just love that, and I think it's good for us to recognize, let's, let's like, look at, you know, daughter, bride, sister, and mother, Let's like we can learn from the temporal and what does that look like to be daughter as I am mm-hmm. living in this world, but also to order it toward eternity and to the Lord. So I think that's that's really good. Um, what does it look like for me to be a daughter? I that's the question, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, part of. Hmm. To be a daughter. I think to know that I'm loved, to know that my father cares. Um, I think about a little girl who, this is, maybe this will be helpful to some women. Mm -hmm. This is a really helpful spiritual exercise for me sometimes to imagine myself as a little girl, um, to put myself, you know, in my PJs or, you know, in my favorite little dress or whatever and to bring myself before my father. And I think a lot of us have experience of earthly fathers and that experience is really different depending on who you talk to. So to kind of take this all with a grain of salt, that can really affect our spirituality Mm -hmm. and the way that we relate to our heavenly father. Um, If we had an earthly father who was really attentive and carrying a good image of our heavenly father, our perfect heavenly father. That's really helpful, but no man is perfect. Mm. (laughs) Uh, My father, my dad, he's, he's pretty good. He's a great man actually. And, but he's also not perfect. So I can look and I can learn a lot, I think. Um, But I also just, yeah, all that to say, we can look at that relationship and learn. So I think about a little girl, um, and you've probably seen little. You've probably seen little girls who have gotten a new Christmas dress, or my niece she got a new tutu. She's kind of into ballet right now, and she, you know, you can imagine this girl like putting on her dress and going and look at me, (laughs) like doing her little twirl. She just wants to be seen. And I think that that speaks a lot to me often, like look at me um, to the heart of who we are as women that we want to be seen. But kind of juxtaposed with that, I see this image of a little girl. Um, This was actually an experience I had once. I I watched this little girl, she's probably a three or four, spill this water, just like it was one of those things with the tab and you know Mm -hmm. it like comes out and it just something happened and the floodgates open and she starts crying at her dad like you know you can see she's like wants to hide her dad comes over and she's like crying and he's like look at me look at me in my eyes look at me in my eyes cc and she looks and he goes you're okay he goes you're okay it's okay it's okay so i just think um there's a lot of good that comes out when we put ourselves in that position of child. I'm still a daughter. I'm, you know, in my late twenties and mm-hmm. there's probably a lot to be explored in what does it mean to be a daughter in my late twenties. But I think imagining ourselves, there's you know, there's the little girl in all of us and imagining ourselves in that place that's still a really deep part of who we are as women. And you, know, I, I think um, a slight little backtrack is it is tr- you know like so we there are two sort of theological principles when we talk about like these earthly relationships and how they help us to understand the divine is 
there's a sacramental principle, which is our earthly relationship, so our relationship with our biological or father or, or our earthly father, it, it points like a sacrament to the divine reality of our relationship with our heavenly father. But then also there's this uh, principle of the analogy of being, which is, is that any um, similarities between earthly things and God have an infinite dissimilarity mm -hmm. in the sense that God is infinitely greater, mm -hmm. um, which I think, you know, that we forget that principle or we don't allow it to really sink into our hearts um, when we hold God to these mm -hmm. sort of broken human relationships. It's the comparison thing again, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like maybe it's a good, a decent place to start. Yeah. But God, you know, as you can't compare women next to men, you almost, you can't compare God next, your father, your heavenly mm -hmm. father next to your earthly father. It's, yeah, I think that's a really, that's a really good point you make. The, the, other th um, the, the other thing, too, that kind of strikes me is I, I never really quite understood what it was to be a son until my father actually died. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think, you know, like, as I kind of think to myself as what a son was like based on, you know, after the death of my father, I do think, like, um, what I, I, and I guess this is the point that I kind of bring to 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 ask is what you know so i think from your this the from the um the things that you've brought up thus far we can say is a father kind of keeps his eyes on his daughter mm -hmm. both in a sense of reassuring and protect i would even say protecting mm -hmm. but also um kind of manifesting her dignity mm -hmm. you know like the um you know the 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 little daughter wants everyone to see her and the fact is, is that her father does see her, mm -hmm. you know, and and that kind of assurance is there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, um, I don't know if if I mean, do you think that that's the essence of the sense that the father has his eyes on her, which is protective and reaffirming, but also, um, you know, it kind of gives her precisely what she needs, which is that someone has their eyes on her. Mm -hmm. Well, this is really, I'm, so I'm taking some classes right now for a master's in psychology and we've talked about attachments mm -hmm. and what you're saying is making me think about it's, it's secure attachment. You know, it's, we want, like, we can have these relationships where we're securely attached and what that means is exactly what you're saying. I know that this person has their eye on me, I'm safe, and the securely attached child will go out and explore. And, you know, look back every once in a while, like, mommy's still there? Like, daddy's still there? Okay, I'm mm. going to go. And it's kind of like this safe home base. They'll, like, go try something, and then they'll, like, come back to mom or dad and, you know, have a little moment of safety, and then, okay, like, go out and explore again. And, yeah, I mean, I think that... That's like, ideally, you know, that's what we experience and what we experience with the Father. And it's really worth, I think, our time to dig into this identity and to, you know, God is Father and a parent that we can be securely attached to. It's worth digging into that because it has everything to do with our freedom and um, our freedom to be more who we're made to be and to explore and to, you know, go out into the world. Um, so, yeah. So, Emily, uh, we proceed in this conversation on feminine spirituality, kind of hitting um, these uh, four uh, relationships, um, which kind of form the identity of um, a woman in the Lord. And the next one, really, um, I wanted to kind of focus on um, is this sort of bridal relationship. Um, now, when it, you know, as a man, you know, when we talk about ma masculine spirituality, this is a, a difficult one because men don't really want to marry Jesus. Um, there's a little, mm -hmm. there's something <laughs> odd about that. Um, but I wonder if, um, I mean, so it, it, this one seems to be an easier 
kind of fit for feminine spirituality. Mm-hmm. So I guess again, like I've I've kind of hit, and you're un you're unmarried. Is, this is mm-hmm. correct. Mm-hmm. So, um, but nonetheless, you experience being a bride. Mm-hmm. Um, so, how do you experience in your relationship with the Lord this sort of bridal relationship? Yeah, it's for all of us, right? We talked about this earlier. These four layers of who we are as women it's for all of us it's not it is manifest maybe in the world but it's 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 in our soul Mm -hmm. (laughs) as women so I think for us as women to sit with what does it mean to be bride and this is something actually it's an area that I recently have desired to learn more about and really okay what does it mean to be bride so we read that the church is the bride of Christ, and so we can kind of relate to that um, as being a part of, you know, mm-hmm. the spouse of Christ. Really cool. We have religious women who consecrate their lives to the Lord wholly as brides of Christ, and what a good witness to be reminded that that's who we are as the whole church, but also for us women to be reminded that's who we are and how a way that we can relate to the Lord. Um, so I'd love for you to ask me some questions about this and, you know, keep pointing us in the right yeah, direction. Yeah. There's so much I could say. Well, and I, th- I think one of the things we have to say, um, and and this is a, a point with, Han, with that Hans Urs von Balthasar makes, is so every vocation is by its nature nuptial. Or another way of saying is that every 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 Christian is called to marriage. Um, we just live that nuptial nature, that nuptial relationship, in different ways. You know, so it may be in the consecration of marriage. You know, of you know between a man and a woman. It may be in the consecrated life, including religious life. Um, and, you know, and it may be in the priesthood, too, that mm-hmm. there is a sense of a nuptial relationship. Um, but I think, you know, when you, um, when you look at a bride, and I think in the sense not just of a bride but also of a wife, mm-hmm. um, and, and maybe, you know, I think as, as we look at that is, you know, the bride's relation or the, the bride's relationship to her husband or the wife's relationship to her husband. Now, again, you know, this is a relationship that's, I mean, it's right at the center of the fall and original sin. You know, that, that's where the conflict really begins is between husband and wife, you know, in, in Eden. Um, but I think is what what in your, you know... In your in your mind, I guess, in your experience, does um, the the groom provide for the bride, and vice versa? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, we can look at a very natural at the natural level of the relationship, but um, then sort of project that on to the Lord. Yeah. Well, what I am thinking about with when you're talking about we're all called to the nuptial relationship, I think about the covenant. And that how that's at the heart of being a bride mm. or being a groom is you're you're cutting covenant with this person and you're saying covenant isn't just a contract, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like I will do this, this, and this, and you will do this, this, and this. Covenant is about the person. It's I want you. I want you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want you. All of you. You know. And that's really, I think, at the heart of being a bride. It's at the heart of being a spouse. Um, I really so like I really like that point because um, you know, again, if you think of all the covenants, you know, they they have various parts. You know, one of them is the one that we kind of fixate on is like the law part. Mm -hmm. Like there are certain things that must be done Mm -hmm. based on this covenant, you know, like the Mosaic covenant, we've got the 10 commandments Mm -hmm. and all the other, Mm -hmm. you know, commands of the Lord that must be obeyed. Mm -hmm. But that's, I mean, especially with the Lord's fidelity to Israel and his mercy to Israel, obviously the commandments 
aren't the whole reality. The real reality of the covenant is the Lord's mm -hmm. relationship mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. and, and I think maybe that's what Bride points to, is not so much all the things that a woman has to do for mm -hmm. the Lord, but rather the Lord's faithfulness to her, mm -hmm. and that there's a real, there's a personal pact, a personal mm -hmm. covenant mm -hmm. between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's who she gets to be for the Lord is his beloved, and um, oh gosh, my, I mean, I'm just like, my mind is spinning, you know, I'm thinking about, it's, it's, this is, I love being a woman. <laughs> so I'm like, this is, like, it makes so much sense to me, I think, because it's so relational. It's like, yeah, of course. And you think about, you kind of mentioned all the covenants in the Old Testament, and the law was written on stone, but then with the new covenant, it's written on our heart, and it's, it's, it's written in our heart, and it becomes about, or like a real covenant of, of the heart mm. and of choosing the Lord for who he is as, you know, our spouse and the Lord choosing us for who we are. And I think about as women, just our capacity to receive. Um, and there's so much I could go into this. I love St. Therese. And one of the things she talks about is being um, a martyr to love or like a victim of love. So she says like all the love that God desires to pour out on people that they reject, I will receive it. What, like, that's such a bride talking, you know? She's like, yeah, love me, you know? Like, and I know if people are wives, you know, like, they will probably say, like, I'm not like that all the time, you know? Like, but I do think there's something about being a bride that says, I will receive you, and I want to receive you. And in receiving, that's such a gift, um, you know, to the Lord that we would say, I will receive you. And um, that that idea of receptivity is kind of where I'm landing here mm. is just as a bride that we would receive. And it's it's just like written all over us as women that we're, we're like made to receive. Um, mm -hmm. and, I th and I think with that too is the the unknown or the mysterious. If you think about um, when a couple enters into marriage, they really don't know what's before them. But they also don't really know each other. Now, I think the implication is that the obviously the Lord knows what he's getting into um, because he knows everything. Um, but there is a sense where the bride, um, you know, sh she can't really exhaust her knowledge of, of her beloved. You know, like there's a sense where um, it's like this journey of discovery, mm -hmm. like getting to know and desiring to know really like intimately who the Lord is always. But different, and already different. he has already he has loved her, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and already he has known her. But yet she is continually growing in this knowledge mm -hmm. of him mm -hmm. and growing in her love for him. So, um, you know, it's, um, I think also with the idea of bride, um, in, you know, and we focus on bride, um, but I try, I want to try to push towards wife because there is sort of a, a stability also, you know, like not just the impetuousness of the beginning, mm -hmm. but a sense of the, the sturdiness of of a life lived together. Mm -hmm. And um, I think maybe as we wrap up, just kind of your thoughts on, you know, um, we've taught like this sort of covenant that they're there for each other. But I think, um, you know, how does, how does woman kind of remain um, living in this sort of faithful relationship to, mm -hmm. to, to her beloved? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's, as you're talking, that's, to me, I think that's part of the heart of being spouse is, you know, we can talk about being child, but when you talk about being spouse, there's something that's on your end, you're choosing. And on your end, you're saying yes. And y you make vows, you know, as husband and wife make vows, like that's kind of, that's our call. 
we have our baptismal vows. And so, I don't know, I guess just how do we live in the faithful relationship? I think it's good to go back to those vows. My my sister and her husband every night before bed, is like, sorry if I'm sharing too much, but they'll like re-say their vows to one another. And maybe that's one way that we can engage in the faithful spousal relationship is to daily come to the Lord and tell him, like, I choose you. And that's can be done through personal prayer. Renewing your baptismal promises. Renew your baptismal promises. We do that at Easter. Mm-hmm. That go to baptisms. Mm-hmm. You can renew them there, you know. But you can just, you can do it, like, whenever. Um, so, yeah, I think just, and then, yeah, I think just the personal daily prayer. You know, I was ta- talking my testimony, how I was told, you can pray every day. And a bride wouldn't go, or a wife probably usually doesn't go most days without seeing her husband. Mm-hmm. So let's like go see the Lord as as his wife, as his spouse, as his bride. So Emily, um, today I wanted to kind of talk about um, being a sister of the Lord. Um, so, you know, it's, um, you know, it's probably, the, it's the th- third of these four kind of basic relationships, which we're kind of using to help understand feminine spirituality. And I guess your experience as a sister to the Lord. So, you know, Emily, um, I guess, the, the you know, kind of as we explain or try to understand um, what it's like to be a sister of the Lord, I think your experience as um, kind of an earthly sister to your own brothers, how, yeah. like what, what's kind of unique about that relationship? My brothers are really, I think having brothers is really fun because... Growing up, you just experience a little bit more, like, rough and tumble with them and, like, getting dirty, and you just kind of get to see um, and be invited into, like, just some of their running around and, like, boyness or, like, Mm -hmm. and now, you know, manliness as as we've all gotten older. What, I mean, what, what, do brothers do for sisters? Mm-hmm. Oh, they they watch out for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they they sometimes tease you a little bit. You know, <laughs> they. I think they're just like a little. They'll nudge you. They'll. I mean, my brothers. They. They'll like. They still do this to me, and it kind of hurts sometimes. But they'll like surround me, and they'll just like hug me, and I'm like thank you, (laughs) like, let me go. So I think with brothers, there's just, like, a real, I experience a lot of joy. Um, But also, you know, they're going to have your back. You know, and and I imagine, you know, so there is this sort of protection, which if we go back to the relationship of a daughter to the father, um, there is this sense where, the you know, the Lord is sustaining us, protecting Mm -hmm. us, um, Keep keeping his eyes upon, but it's from the perspective of someone higher, you know, kind of looking down mm-hmm. in this sort of. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that's what the kind of the uniqueness of this relationship is. You do have someone who's protecting you, mm-hmm. um, but fr- from the sense of your peer, like as yeah, an equal, it's or really as a peer. side by side. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Which I think is true with the Lord, like as we, you know, if we're reflecting on what is it like to call Jesus my brother as as a woman, Mm -hmm. what does that mean to call Jesus my brother? There's like a real um, Mm side-by-sideness to that as well. And I think, you know, it's like a different facet to consider. I think when I sit with, you know, Jesus is my bridegroom there's just like a little more like intensity there sometimes Mm -hmm. and like relational you know but as my brother there's there's like this real sense of we're like going somewhere to get there or like um and I'm gonna fight for you and protect you and you know like be with you and the their expectation there I don't know 
Yeah. Sometimes I think with, when you consider like the spousal imagery, there's like, oh, there's some expectations here. Mm-hmm. Like you are asking me to reciprocate, you mm-hmm. know, like my love for you. But then with the brother, it's like, Jesus, my brother, it's like, okay, let's like go and do this and be together. And, um, you know, like these, these also, these all overlap. Mm-hmm. Like, Jesus is my brother, but he is also my spouse. You know, like mm-hmm. he's both. And our spouse, the brother, first, you know. But I think it's really, it's it's good to consider him as brother. I've I've of, I've often wondered, and I don't know, maybe you can answer this, but um, how brothers help sisters prepare for marriage. Um, you know, in this in the sense like. Um, you know, that is their first experience. And I, I've kind of seen this in marriage preparation, too, mm-hmm. where you can tell um, maybe the guys who don't have any sisters mm-hmm. or the, um, the young women who, who have no brothers. Mm-hmm. And it's different than if they do have, you know, mm-hmm. brothers or if they do have sisters. Mm-hmm. Like, there is something which... Um, you know, sisters help brothers mm-hmm. understand a little bit about what it means to be a woman. Yeah. Enough for them to kind of um, help in the pursuit of marriage and vice versa, too. Yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting. You always hear, like, women need to learn how to be women from other women. And mm-hmm. men need to learn how to be men. Or boys need to learn how to be men from other men. But I do think there is something that we even, you know, I that we learn from each other um, about ourselves. So, like, Mm -hmm. my brothers have helped me learn even more what it is to be a woman and what it is to be respected and what I deserve and what I'm worthy of. And I like to think that I've helped them learn a little bit of, you know, what is it to be a man and to relate with women, like, you can carry this thing and you can let me go first and you can open the door, but also like you can have emotions and you can care about things and um, good for them to experience that Mm -hmm. freedom for themselves. Good for me to experience, Oh, like this is how, you know, he's, he's just him. And I, and I wonder if that is part of the uniqueness of being a sister of Christ is Christ helps to form woman to be in relationship with others and to be in, especially to be in relationship with men. Um, but I think in general to be in relationship with others. So mm-hmm. he's there as a peer mm-hmm. um, watching over, you know, his sisters mm-hmm. so that his sisters can be in healthy and, and wholesome and charitable relationship with others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, now, fi- as finally, kind of um, the last of these four relationships is as mother, mm-hmm. which I think is, at least in my mind, is somewhat, I is somewhat imaginable in my mind. Be- Saint Francis of Assisi talks about how we all must be mothers mm-hmm. of Christ in the sense of bearing Him mm-hmm. in ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that still does not make any sense to me in, in some sense, you know. But I, I think that that may be the point that's driven at. So I don't know, how, how do you experience motherhood yeah. um, in your relationship with the Lord? Yeah, well, all women are, are called to be mother. And I think a big part of that is our capacity to carry, like in our very bodies, like a woman will carry life to term, right? but also in our spirits. And I think Mary, Mother of God, is a great woman to look at. Um, She carries the Holy Spirit. She carries Jesus. Um, So I just, I think about that a lot. And as as a woman, it makes all the sense in the world that I would carry Christ to other people, that I would mother. Um, And I think, too, like we carry the Lord, but also we have this capacity to carry others. We get to kind of share in God's heart in the way that God carries his children, 
with him. And as women, we really get, you know, when you carry a life with you, my friends or whoever, these people I reach out to on campus, it's like, wow, you have, like, you're here, you know, you can move across the country, but like, I'm going to carry you in my heart. And I think with that comes also a great capacity to suffer because we, as women, carry people with us and we care for them when they hurt we hurt um and that is a great way too to enter into the life of Christ and his suffering um I hope that's not too like no 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 I think that's that's great no no that's I think that's um especially and and I think also like nurturing Christ Mm -hmm. in oneself and Mm -hmm. It seems, um, you know, on the one hand with, with feminine spirituality, so this sort of motherhood is nurturing the presence of Christ in your life. Um, yeah, and in, I, in, and in others' lives. Exactly, And yeah. how do we nurture them and help them to grow? Yeah. And, you know, and I think that that's um, one, of the, one of the things that I do grasp about women is so their ability to kind of nurture holiness Mm -hmm. in the world. Um, That's why we talk Mm -hmm. about the church as a mother. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's why we see um, the effect of women in handing on the faith, Mm -hmm. um, in um, raising raising children. And um, I think, you know, it's just this idea of nurturing the presence of the Lord in Mm -hmm in the family and in the church and in civilization. Mm-hmm. We need good fathers, too. Yeah, for, that. for sure. But I would say this before we end. Um, I think these four, daughter, bride, sister, mother, um, they're really worth every woman taking time. We talked about a lot and, you know, kind of our windy path. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, the time was so short. But just encourage all the women listening to really maybe take some time with each of those and to have their own reflections and their own thoughts and reflect on their own experience of each of these in their life. And how does that relate to the Lord? And actually ask God to reveal something new in those so that we're not just comparing, but that he can actually bring some real light um, and revelation about who he is, but also about who he who you are as a woman. And so just I wanted to say that as an encouragement before yeah. we before we wrap up. Excellent. Thank you. Well, you've been listening to Conversations on Discipleship. Until next time, peace and all good.